Hi there, I'm Abby. I'm with LDB Capital. We invest in people, building businesses powered by visual technology. We thrive on collaborating with deep technical teams at the pre-seed and seed stage that leverage computer vision, machine learning, and artificial intelligence in order to analyze visual data. This is our series, Women Leading Visual Tech. The purpose of our series is to highlight some of the top ladies whose work in visual technologies are revolutionizing business and society. We hope that we'll cultivate a community of female entrepreneurs, investors, and technologists who are willing to help each other succeed. In this interview, I had the pleasure of chatting with Dr. Sujatha Ramanujan. Dr. Ramanujan is a serial entrepreneur and seasoned executive with 25 years of experience in medical devices and consumer electronics. She started, built, and grown three startups specialized in cardiac surgery equipment, optical communications, and nanomaterials. In addition, Dr. Ramanujan has held scientific, technical leadership and laboratory head positions at Chrysler Corporation, GE, Kodak, CareStream, and Intrinsic Materials. She holds a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan and is an executive board member of the National Women's Hall of Fame. She holds 28 issued US patents. Dr. Ramanujan currently manages Illuminate. It's a nonprofit investment fund and accelerator for companies in optics and photonics. Her team identifies 10 promising companies, invests $100,000 in each, and provides six months of comprehensive training and support. These companies then compete for a $2 million follow-up finding, financing. Luminate has just formed their fourth cohort, and we can't wait to learn more about it. I hope that you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Ramanujan just as much as I did. Enjoy. Well, Sujatha, thank you so much for joining me today. It's such a pleasure to have you on Women Leading Visual Tech. We've known each other for a while. You you were a judge at our Vision Summit a couple of years ago. Yeah, thank you so much for including me. I'm happy to be part of this, and I'm really excited to see all of the progress that you know LDV and Vision Summit are making. Oh, thanks so much. So um, let's start from the beginning. The way that I start with everybody's by kind of just asking you, in one sentence, how do you describe what you do? We identify companies from all over the world. We bring them in, we get them ready for further investment. We invest in them and we coach them. Fantastic. So, you know, tell me a little bit about your path to here. Um, you know, you've now become an investor in all of these optics companies, um, but you started out as an electrical engineer. You're focused on optics, right? So looking back, what was, was there one particular crossroad that you came to that drove you towards optics and nanomaterials? You know, it's kind of interesting that, you know, when I first, I, I didn't think I was going to be this, whatever I am. And you, you never do, right? You, like you go off to college and you're like, I'm going to be an astronaut. Um, <laughs> it doesn't work out that way. And I actually got on a project my senior year in college where I was, um, it's one of those interdisciplinary, I went to the University of Michigan, interdisciplinary projects. And I was asked to help out on a project as um which had a laser design aspect to it. And it was really, really fascinating. And that was a small company that was eventually sold to 3M. And you know, it was, I found that whole experience really, really invigorating and fascinating. Yeah. So I finished my uh, bachelor's degree, but I didn't actually go straight into optics. I, I'm, I'm, my first passion was always mathematics. And mm -hmm. optics is a, is a way of mathematics, right? So if yeah. you, mathematics is the granddaddy <laughs> or grandma. <laughs> um, and I got a job. I got a job with GE as right out of my undergraduate degree. It was a, it was a rotational program and it had a heavy mathematical bent. And, you know, about a year and a half into it, I realized a couple of things. Um, one, that I wanted to go to graduate school because the type of work I wanted to do is far more researchy, far more in-depth in the science and not basic engineering. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't think defense contracting at that point in my life is really something that fascinated me. <laughs> And I, and I really loved that experience with optics. So I left GE and I went back to graduate school and I you know, went through the graduate program in, in a, um, I, worked, I worked in a nonlinear dynamics type optics area, which meant that it was heavily mathematical. I did a lot of mathematical modeling and then we eventually built and measured the devices that we modeled. So I came at everything very, very theoretically, very, very mathematically, and then went to a practical implementation of it, uh, which I just love doing. Yeah. It was really neat. And I met my husband in graduate school and he got a job. He was four years senior to me and he got a job at Kodak. So we were dating and I basically followed him out here. We got married while I was still in graduate school. And I got involved with another small business then for, for a little while. It was great. That business also sold and did quite well. So it was in between graduate school and taking the job in the research labs. Mm -hmm. So then I went to the research labs with this 
it was an optics research lab. It was engineering physics and they did a lot of optics work and got to do all kinds of, it was one of those exciting research lab things where, you know, anything goes in the days of the <laughs> corporate, uh, you know, the corporate research labs of plenty before Kodak had its problems. You, we did all kinds of stuff from like AR, initial AR, VR stuff, immersive technologies, digital cinema, uh, digital printing, image process, it, you name it, we were doing it. It was so much fun. And <laughs> some of the stuff made it out in the public hands, and some of it didn't. Uh, when we first started working in digital cinema, it was still film, right? So I'm really old, right? So everything was all pretty much still film. We got thrown out of a lot of offices with this crazy digital cinema idea. Really? Everybody's actually, like, no way, that's... that's well, they're like, why would we eat our own gonna lunch? Happen. Like, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. You can choose it or you can have it done to you. You can choose to be the leader or be run over. Yeah. Um, so, well, they chose run over. But <laughs> <laughs> we actually did implement digital cinema. We went, we did it in the uh, big Kodak Theater in Hollywood. And, and it, was, cool. it was so much fun. And that was one of the many projects that we got to work on. And I went from there as things started to get a little difficult in the main line of Kodak to, I also did a lot of, the, I joined the strategic investment group as a technical person to help vet technically potential investments and acquisitions. And, you know, things were still healthy back then. Yeah. And that's how I actually got to learn a lot of the skills that an investor has to have. My first, uh, I had good eye. So I picked out like, we should pick this company and they sold for like 250 million, but we didn't get them. Um, then I picked another company and they sold for 130 million. Again, we had gotten them <laughs> the third time I'm like okay it's this one and you know I pull it in and I bring it in and they're like this is a bad investment I'm like okay you need to explain to me why this company's a bad investment mm -hmm. and they gave me a very business-like clear reason why it was a bad investment technically outstanding technology but mm -hmm. from an investment point of view a bad idea uh and it was a liquid crystal on silicon group and then okay. I really and this is, you know, they're talking 1990s. So liquid crystal and silicon was very new. And most of my yeah. work at that point was in spatial light modulators. The other two technologies are also SLM technologies. I'm like, wow. SLMs are the thing now. You need to, you need to invest. And, and the, the strategic arm explained to me why financially for us to put money into that company as opposed to buy their product didn't make sense. Yeah. And I understood better. And I started working with them. I made some really good investments. But, you know, eventually that piece of Kodak is struggling. Yeah. But so it sounds I'm, like you really enjoyed, like you're in this lab where you're doing so many exciting and, and forward-looking things that you kind of got addicted to that forward-looking nature of stuff. And so it started to kind of be, you know, like uh, an imperative part of how you got to think is joining the investment side of things and thinking, well, where are these industries going? Where are the trends going? Yeah. And what makes business sense? Because we needed, it started out simple enough. I needed a really good SLM component for something that I was trying to build. And I started looking at what are the emerging technologies. And I was like, what? Oh, that, you know, and yeah. so it was, there's so many exciting things happening. Uh, so that's kind of how I got involved with that group. Uh, I did, I did move from that group to health imaging shortly thereafter uh, for a variety of reasons. One, I wanted to do something different. Yeah. And I had been running the printed electronics group at that point. So I had the laboratory and all the people who were working in material science, printed nano and things like that were, were reporting to me, but there was a lot of reorganization and mm -hmm. a lot of things changing and Kodak was really shrinking. And I had to take a hard look at where my career was going, which was mm -hmm. not the best trajectory to be sitting there anymore. Yeah. So my, my, philosophy has always been out of these changes usually comes a chance to do something different learn something new mm -hmm. um, so and I and I like that it's not for everybody some people like to move in within a straight line of you know going straight up and that works really well for people so I'm not mm -hmm. trying to like knock it but for me this kind of like oh that's a little bit of the butterfly thing I like oh that's really interesting and so Absolutely. I took that as a really great opportunity and I moved to the health imaging group and got involved in mammography and uh Mammography was really, you know, I had, some of my research work back when I was in grad school was mammal related. So this mm -hmm. was a natural step. And I ended up becoming the CTO of a group that did a mathematical analysis, um, computer detection type for mammal for other types of cancers. And so it took that math side of things like that number side still, of your It's brain image brain. processing. So it's still yeah. a visual tech. You're, you're grabbing image data from various modalities and then really analyzing them. And so that was really something I had felt a lot of passion about was that mammal piece. Um, ma breast cancer runs in my family. Like I should actually say it gallops in my family. So I was really wow. like 
was I was really motivated to do something in the field. And a lot yeah. of times from those things, those things, my my grand, my mother had breast cancer. I've had breast cancer. Both wow. my my mother in law, everybody. It's wow. like it's just, and we're all we're all. Oh, well, my mother in law passed away a number of years ago, not of breast cancer, um, but. You know, we've survived it, but we survived it because science made it survivable. Yeah. yeah. So I have to look at can science make it obsolete is the next question. Not yeah. just so that was a really fascinating area of work for me. And then what happened was I ended up having my second child. So I took time off yeah. maternity leave from that from that position. I came back and found that I was now running that business because they had moved <laughs> like I was only senior personal after I'm like okay and so I moved into okay like, hey, welcome back hope you enjoyed your rest and now you are the head <laughs> now you're the head of this business and we started doing pediatric imaging also and various other types it was really really exciting and I loved what I was doing and it was growing and it was changing um, and I did that for a number of years and then a couple of things changed simultaneously. Uh, the job is still really good, and and I really did enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, but I had uh, first of all, I had a really good offer coming in. Um, I also found that I loved the work. I I, you know, I loved the teams. I loved the company. Mm -hmm. I loved everything. What I did not love was working in a large company. And I, I kind of was itching for that like small startup feel. And yeah. it was one of the really toughest decisions I made was to leave the large company because it was now it was CareStream, it was no longer Kodak. And I'd helped with I'd worked as an analyst and I'd done a lot of you know other interesting work. This it was a really outstanding opportunity. Yeah. Um, but I got a call from actually from one of the aides in our senator's office saying that this new company, or actually not that one of the economic development agencies saying there's a company trying to locate their business in the United States and they need a senior management team who mm -hmm. can impl implement it. This, and these are the investors. They need a, se a seasoned, really good senior management team. And you have the materials background and you have been with small businesses before and you've got, and you've got all the connections. Can you, would you consider doing this? Yes. So I stepped so, in. So you're sitting there, you know, like you've got the the nice job uh, working on something that you're passionate about, obviously, and it has big implications for women and women's health. Um, and you've got all the benefits and the luxuries of a big organization. And you've got two kids at home and a husband. And you're like, I want to. And obviously, I am absolutely company. insane. As I chuck it all and I go for this other thing, right? <laughs> um, great. So, so what was it just about this opportunity that made it like I can't pass this up? You know, it was a couple, there were a lot of things that came into place simultaneously. And one of them was just my nature. And I really need to be at the cutting edge of stuff and to really like watch something grow and, and really emerge. And that it's, it's in, it's in my DNA kind of to just, and, and I like, like, I like the thrill, right? I don't, I'm not a person, everybody has their worst fear. Mine's boredom. Okay. So there, there are people who are like, I'm so afraid I'll lose my job. And so what if this happens? What if that happens? Yeah. My, if you ask me, what, what am I afraid of? I'm afraid I'll be bored. I'm afraid yeah. that I will get up and 20 years will have passed and nothing will have changed. You love the challenge. Yeah. So for me, that, that was a kind of a, a motivating thing. There are a lot of other little aspects in there, not and big aspects. I live in Rochester and we've had a lot of economic struggle here. A lot of people have lost their jobs. It's been a lot of, you know, a lot of economic uncertainty mm -hmm. and I firmly believe the biggest path to employment and to they want manufacturing jobs, it's it's an innovation. The best way to grow employment and to grow the economy is to create, is yeah. to create things that people need and make businesses out of it. Um, yeah. And so I felt that if I helped them bring this company here and create jobs in the area, that people who had lost their jobs could be employed, that we could be doing something really positive. And on the side of leaving the previous company, um, I'm really proud of the work that we did there. We introduced product all over the world. We got some really great innovative things out there, but it had gotten to the point where that job was less about innovation and more about um, business growth execution, which is really, really important. And I, I don't want to like knock it, but there were people who were dying to do that, well positioned to do that. And, you know, big sure. companies a bit like Hydra, right? You knock off someone's head, someone else's head will be right there. So it's not, <laughs> it's not like, the business is going to go away or anything else but well and we always find that too like there's there's a sweet spot as companies grow 
Mm-hmm. Right. That's like, where do you want to be within that company's growth cycle? Because it, a lot of times people who are like early stage, super innovators, you know, jack of all trades, like to get things done, aren't necessarily the best fit as a company hits like that super growth stage. Um, and it's also not where you like to be. Right. And so you always have to make sure that you're keeping that in mind. And in big companies, it's also a very different thing. Right. So I, and I think for me, it was time to try a smaller company again. Um, the business was stable and you know, the other, it was, you know, things, things were, we were actually back ordered, which is another, another story. Cause people think that's a great place to be, but you don't want to be backwarded. You want to have your projections correct. Yeah. Um, and I'd been fighting to get, but we ended up back ordered. Um, Interesting. And, uh, there was, there were lessons learned in that too. And so, so you just I, uh, this opportunity to not only join a company that was like innovating and doing something really exciting, getting back to like that startup feel and mentality, but also like the wider social and economic implications for your community were a big role to play. It was a huge big deal because I know I watched a lot of my colleagues lose their jobs. Um, my husband was still at the time employed by Kodak, but you know, you could see the writing on the wall and he yeah. could see the writing on the wall. And I really got tired of the narrative. The, mm-hmm. Oh, Kodak's going downhill in Rochester, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I'm like, you know what? You own your narrative. Yeah. And this actually, there's 150 optics companies in this region. Wow. There's a lot of innovation in this region. So you can choose to focus on the thing. I mean, everything has a life to it. Everything. So, oh, yeah. so say, I'm, I'm actually, I went to the University of Rochester for my undergrad and my, my, I have a bunch of family who lived in the Rochester area who, who still do. Um, and so that was like kind of one of the feelings when I was going to college there. Kodak had just closed down um, mm-hmm. and it was starting to feel almost, you know, uh, dead in some ways. It felt and, like Eeyore. Yeah. I felt like I was talking to Eeyore every time I went out there, like <laughs> probably gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, that's your choice. Um, but you know, now, now there's like a new energy or revitalization to it that came in part from, from companies like the one that you joined and now what you're trying to do with Luminate to get, you know, to leverage all of these optical experts that reside in the area already um, who are starting to do new things and, and try to, to create new companies that can then be headquartered in Rochester. Exactly. And you, you think about it, you know, every, every company was a small company once, even the big ones. Mm-hmm. And we do live in a time where we have the ability to innovate and to to work with multiple companies. And the way you know economy has changed and communication has changed, it makes it a lot easier to collaborate. Everything doesn't have to be under one roof anymore. Yeah. And so it makes it a lot easier to grow. And so with all of that, with the economic downturn and everything that was happening, and I felt like I, I can either be part of the problem or part of the solution. I'm going to choose to be part of the solution. And I made a very, very difficult decision to step away from that, that mammal business and, and move on. But I learned a lot. First of all, I got class three devices through FDA and, and launched <laughs> worldwide. So, you know, that's an experience. That alone is an enormous accomplishment. <laughs> yeah, so now I'm, I feel pretty good about the things that I can say I've done. And it's kind of fun to work with some of these startup companies who are talking to me about the FDA process. I'm like, believe me, I've lived it. Yeah. Um, so I took this job and it was a material science. When I say took this job, it was like, go make a company. So it was two of us, <laughs> um, me and this, me and this, I was the CEO and there was a CEO and, you know, we were, it was fun, right? You know, so we we're booking out of our various living rooms and, and growing this business. And there was a lot of it was in England. And, wow. and so, so tell me, what did you, what did you build? What were you most um, successful at in your mind? Um, in this company or in general? Yeah, in this company. Okay, so this company was a tricky company because of the three companies that I did, that was startups that I was involved in, this one eventually did not succeed. But it had, we did do really well. For, it sold, but not, it didn't sell at a great. Yeah. Everybody, you know, there's selling and then there's selling. It was <laughs> selling. Um, <laughs> so well, my job was, there's so many lessons learned from journeys like that, right? Like every single venture that you do isn't going to be like a hugely successful one, but the lessons that you learned can be even more valuable as you go forth from there. There was so much I learned from this company that I take with me every single day. Mm-hmm. Uh, I learned the value of my team. I had a, I had the the really great fortune of being able to really build my team, like pick and choose. And so we picked and choose, pick and chose. Uh, and we had, uh, and it was, like I said, it's a nanomaterials company, yeah. but we were half women. 
when the US team was half women, our, our director of manufacturing was a woman, one of our senior research scientists was a woman, one of our techs was a woman, our accounting front office. And, and everybody was there, not because I'm going to hire women, but because we walked out there and said, we're going to we're going to hire, we're going to cast that net wide, and we're not going to just reach out to the proverbial old network. Yeah. And so more than I can say, more than the specifics of innovation and we did some really exciting things we, we were making printable metals for like print circuit boards and for all kinds of really fascinating fascinating mm -hmm. applications i am really proud of the way that that business was a high-tech material science business that was 50 percent women wow. in senior jobs and i say i don't mean like 50 percent women that like i've hired of somebody to write answer the yeah. yeah no and these not, not to women. You know, not to say no, that I don't mean that I'm not knocking the HR department because HR department was women, but really um, went out of our way to make sure we had a really good work environment. And we were building and we were innovating and we had some really A list clients. And then I learned some really important lessons. I, um, I got ill. That's when I had breast cancer. So I had to go home. Oh, wow. And by the time I came back, a lot of things had changed. I learned. Um, a lot of things have changed. They eventually turned over the CEO to somebody else. And mm -hmm. I learned that I will only, that I will not work in an environment unless I really respect the people I work with in the team. Yeah. Um, that no, no innovation, no profit, nothing is worth an environment that, that doesn't treat people great. Um, Absolutely. It isn't. And maybe it is, I used to think when I was younger, I can work with anybody. You can, but I don't want to. Yes. And, and you I don't, don't have to. to. Look, you know, like if you're in a lucky enough position where you don't necessarily have to do what needs to in order to like keep food on the table for your family, then absolutely like making sure that there's respect as a bottom line is a huge thing. And actually, I think that like, you know, coming off of a health related incident where you need to take time off for to improve your well being, right? it could only be a beneficial thing for the company that you're working for and working with. Um, and so people who don't respect that entirely could can definitely be a huge detriment. Yeah, I mean, that's part of it. I also think I also learned about, everybody has things that are very, very, very important to them. And, mm -hmm. and they consider their ethical profile, their my moral compass. Yeah. Um, when you have a team, and I actually teach a whole class on how you build a team. Oh, yeah. that you need to have a diversity of opinion, but you need to have a common purpose. Mm -hmm. So you, you, I want all different ideas. I don't want 10 clones of me sitting around because that's just frightening. But um, I want people with different personalities and different thoughts and different ways of thinking. But you need to be pointed in the same direction and you need to operate from the basic idea of what is right and what is wrong. Yeah. If you have a different set of what is right and what is wrong, or you're going in different directions, then you will create a dysfunctional team. Yeah, and that's such a great point. Alignment of those core values yes. and of core purpose uh, can be such a huge player. Now, I used to think when I used to have to go to all those workshops that big companies would send us to about, you know, let's do mission value purpose, let's do this. <laughs> and I'm like, oh God, here we go. Um, like anybody cares what I think, but, and then you come up with, we believe in honesty. I'm like, am I sitting, of course you believe in honesty. Who sits in the room and says, I believe in dishonesty. You don't. Um, but the reality is that people have a different idea of what that means. Yeah. And so I, as I tell my teams when we're, build, when we're doing team building exercises, I'm like, whatever you are, you need to know that and embrace it. If you are a superhero ethical person, then surround yourself with people like that. If you are a super villain, just own it. Okay. Just go <laughs> out there and just put together. You know, go, go your be team Lex of super villains. <laughs> like, oh, just own what you are. And if you're Lex Luthor, you are Lex Luthor. Go get him. <laughs> like, um, That's but, great. But and so have, that's a huge like learning that you then obviously take to all the companies that you work with at Luminate. Um, you know, having the opportunity to invest in these in the top next generation optics companies and, and provide them with these kinds of insights, you know, it, it's got to be incredibly exciting. Are there any trends in technologies or solutions that you're currently witnessing? There's some really exciting things happening. And I think one of the big questions we need to ask, ask ourselves in, in visual tech is, um, there, there's some very specific areas. Now, I know there's a huge amount of work being done in AR, VR. I do think a lot of that's being led by the Oculus Facebook people. It's being led by Magic Leap. Um, 
And it's a tough place to navigate as a result because those larger companies are very secretive about what they're doing. So you may think you're innovating, but you might be, you know, reinventing something they already have, and then you're going to struggle with. So while I think that there's a whole lot of space for innovation there, it's a tougher, it's a tougher area for a small company to navigate. Mm -hmm. Unless you have something that's truly, truly different and people are grabbing at it then yeah. then it's something but if you just because you think it's new it may not be so yeah. you need to go out there and get a lot of information but some of the areas that are really i think um i think really critical right now are how is visual tech and optical technologies used in um in pharmaceutical and biotech mm. okay and i think and that and the question that we need to ask ourselves is what are the unanswered questions in biotech um and so give me give me an example like of one of the questions that you've seen people starting to scratch at the surface of solving for. So I was working with a company that was doing an assay readout system. It was an assay and the readout. So everybody was focused on the chemistry of the assay and how you're going to read it out. The real issue was signal to noise on the readout. To me, that's an optical science question. So yeah, rather than sure. beating up the chemistry all day long, let's look at the optical system and see what we can do to make that better. Yeah. Um, and that was a small company that I was working with a number of, a while ago, but I also think we need to have a better communication between that pharmaceutical research and the pharmaceutical development and our optical developers. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that they have optics groups in their, in their pharmaceutical research companies, and so, but yeah. to really build a stronger collaboration so that we understand what the real shortcomings are, because otherwise we're, we're making things we think people need. Um, yeah. But if we go in there and understand better where the real challenges are, I think that, yeah. Uh, yeah, just so, um, you know, like one of, and I'd love to hear your perspective on it, but one of the reasons why we classify, at LDV that we classify these as visual technologies is because of the, the fluorescent dyes and the fluorescence imaging that's taking place in order to understand the assays, for instance, or the genetic sequence or, or, or things like this. And so is that how you see it too? Is that like these optical processes around reading out the, the dyes is the most critical aspect for these companies? It is a critical aspect, but I wonder if it's the most. I wonder if we don't know what the most is because we are looking at it as optics people looking in the window of the pharma company. And I'm wondering yeah. if, if, if the real question hasn't been asked, but right on the surface, yes, that does look like one of the big issues. Like how do you, how do you visualize that? Is it a chemistry problem? Is it an optical processing problem? You know, just, um, I think that that's a huge, huge area that we need to really take a good look at. Um, I also think quantum technology and quantum encryption and and really what is security. So we had one of our companies in our, in our profile was creating a truly random number generator. If you know, when you talk about random numbers, they're not random, they're all seeded algorithms. Um, yeah. But optics, and photonics is inherently seated random. <laughs> the first thing comes out is random. It's, it's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It is going to be random. So if you start that with that principle, uh, I think you could really revolutionize how security, how quantum encryption, how that entire area is explored. And, and it's it's a long-term problem. It's not immediate, but you know, financial institutions need it. Everyone needs it. Absolutely. Um, and I think- As we get closer and closer, the quantum compute problem being solved, the, the quantum security problem is an even bigger one, right? Exactly. So there's it's, it's steps to get there, but I think that that I think we're just at the cusp of something amazing there. So the biotech and the quantum, I, you know, there's so many things that I, that are it's you know you're like a kid in a candy store, like oh, <laughs> that. Um, and so I, I get really excited when I see those types of those types of innovation. And I also think that that area of innovation is gonna take a lot of patience and investors yeah. because there's, it's not just the technology, it's a lot of how does this get adopted? How does, and it, it, that's challenging for, for a small business to go after something like that because you go to an investor and they're like, I, I, how do I cash out in five years? And you try to explain to them, this might be 10. And they're like, yeah, come back in five and we'll talk and, and you're swimming, right? Exactly. You know, that's, it's actually one of the big things that we have a problem with, right, or that we think about a lot at LDV, which is that like our primary 
uh, responsibility is to generate returns for our investors. Right? Exactly. We are an asset manager at the end of the day. And so when we're looking at these, these technologies, one of the biggest things that we start to think about is, okay, well, when are they going to come to fruition? You know, is this bleeding edge? Is this cutting edge? Or is this like on the verge of commercialization? Because ideally we want to be like in that cutting edge sweet spot because we invest so early and we're looking for the five to 10 year time frame, right? But I can imagine that it's incredibly challenging um, with all of these quantum companies and with biotechnology companies and even with any type of like healthcare hardware company, right? Like coming from your background in, in mammography, right? Going through the FDA process and everything else, it, we found that there's so many investors that like basically won't touch anything in healthcare hardware because of the longevity that you need in order to generate returns from it. Is it, that it, something it, that you guys think about at Luminate? It is. It is actually something. So I look at us. We also, like you are a fund and we have to return investment. We are a different type of fund. We are a not-for-profit mm -hmm. and we also run an accelerator. Um, and we have a responsibility to return to the, to the state. One of both, hopefully, things, employment mm -hmm. and cash return on investment. But if we can pick a company that maybe takes 10 years, yeah. but creates 100 jobs in the process, yeah. We can actually handle that because our investor, the state, will look at the headcount and say, okay, the company, maybe they're not going to return, they're not going to go public or they're not going to be sold right now, but they're yeah. steadily employing people in the region. We're good with that. So we have a little bit of a luxury that not everyone has. Yeah, that's nice. It's because, you know, understanding that there's all different value propositions as opposed to just return on capital, which is one way in which you can generate value for stakeholders. But jobs is, is another huge value for stakeholders. That's fascinating. For state fund, I mean, in the end, even the money that they put back, you know, if they generate revenue and they generate profit, that money under normal circumstances, they would just go back out to invest in another company. Why? Because we want to create jobs. We want people yes. to be employed in the region. I mean, there are other issues afoot right now with the state needing money for various things. Yes. Um, but in, in a more normal environment, even that reinvestment is done with the idea of growing businesses, growing employment. Yeah. And so, um, we have a little bit of a luxury. If you look at our portfolio, though, we're 40% medical device right now. And part of that has to do with who applies to us. And I think we get a lot of people who are in that boat where they have a really great idea, they really need to move it forward, but nobody wants, like, I don't have my FDA approval yet. And no one wants to touch me until I've got that. And I understand that. I, I know how arduous that FDA process is. I've been through it a few times. Uh, and as an investor, it's ex exceptionally risky to take somebody at that state, unless you can help them get through that process. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's the other part, I think, that between the resources we have here at, at the University of Rochester and our own personal team's background, if somebody comes to me and says, I need to get through the FDA process, help me. We have clinical experts who can come in. We can help them get their clinical trials moving. And that's kind of why we're able to take those companies. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, you know, what a great position to be in to understand like that you're generating um, so much more than just capital back to the community and to your investor. Um, yes. You know, so what makes you think that at this point in time, you're, you're saying, you know, like this is such an exciting time to be in, in optics and photonics, you know, like what makes you think that like this is the time? Like, why does it make right now in history the most exciting point for you? You know, honestly, because some of the incredible innovations that have come out of optics and physics since the 1990s, mm. some really amazing um, steps and jumps, uh, particularly in, in quantum theory and quantum optics. Um, I think that with a move towards um, uh, a, a move towards either IoT type of behavior or even just you know just the sheer amount of data and communication, it really enables. Um, ideas and concepts that took a whole lot more depth than we were able to manage. I, I look back at my graduate work and my graduate work was on um, you know, chaos theory and mathematical modeling. And I would write these models to, to, to do stochastic processes and then and, and quantum processes in semiconductor material. And they would run for like four days just so I could see what the result was. You know, things that would run like this now. Yeah. So we have, I mean, and I mean, I get 10 minutes. It's actually, oh. it's funny that you say that because so earlier in the season we had um, Dr. McCollipson on She's a MacArthur what? fellow up at Columbia. I, I think you know her. Yeah, I know her. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like one of the things that she talked about is how excited she is about the potential of photonic chips to optimize mm -hmm. these gigantic data centers. 
because of the explosion AI of AI. Exactly. And being able to increase, you know, like our processing power with, you know, much less space and, and better able chips in order to speed up our algorithms and everything else has been like, you know, a big thing that, that she believes in that we believe in too. And so it sounds like that is something that like is at the top of your mind as well. It is. I, I, I think her work in particular is absolutely groundbreaking and fascinating for that reason that suddenly you can ask questions you couldn't ask before. I mean, that's probably the most layman's way I can explain it is every, every invention is limited by the question that you ask. Mm. Okay, so your invention starts with a question. Now, if I can ask these questions, it would have taken a lot to get to a kind of a fuzzy answer and I can get answers, I can innovate. Yeah. I can make, you know, everything on a chip makes everything faster. It means analysis is faster. It means data is more deeply driven. When I look at mammography and the progress of mammography, when I started working in um, in MAMO, first of all, it was the first thing that was limited was capture limited. You couldn't get the right quality of image data. Everybody was trying really hard to take mm -hmm. images without over X-raying women, without doing, you know, can I do it holographically? We can get good image data now. The next question became, can we, you know, you're relying on physicians and a little bit of, you know, intuitive and some yeah. things get missed things get missed. Can we come up with mathematical algorithms that say, I see, I see in this image what's wrong. Yep. And um, to so, be able to, to see it faster and to be able to see it better. Accurately it better. and to, you know, access, because a lot of what's wrong, it's, it's, not, it's not something that's obvious. So when you, when you say, I'm looking for cancer, it could be a mass, it could be a microcalcification. It could be a lot of vascular vascularization where you shouldn't be. It could be an asymmetry. There's all kinds of things that you're looking for. So you had to come up with these semantic knowledge type of things where you would look and understand an image, but that's changed now. Now it's really deep learning algorithms. And those algorithms are enabled by speed of processing. Yeah. And, and this giant data centers and all that. And suddenly you can get to a much more accurate result with a much more complex question. So you can see the evolution happening. Yeah, very exciting time to be in the space, right? It, it, um, is. it is. So, you know, if, if you had to give advice uh, to those who have an idea or they've identified a problem, but they haven't built a business out of it yet or even started to, what would your advice be and how to take those first steps? The very first thing you have to do with your idea is make sure that it's necessary. So go out and I tell people to talk to everybody. And I don't mean just talk to like people who like you and who are your friends, because your friends will not tell you that's stupid. <laughs> and mother will always tell you your baby's beautiful. It uh -huh. might be the ugliest baby on the planet, but mom's <laughs> going to tell you that's a beautiful baby. You need to go out to all everybody and just ask and keep asking. And throughout the business process, no matter what stage your business is in, talk to every potential client. Mm -hmm. um, find out what they need, find out what's hurting them, show them your ideas, yeah. be, be that person who's gregarious and out there because you need to make what people need. Yeah. And you may, a lot of times I'll hear, well, they don't know what I can do. So they don't know they can do this. I'm like, okay, so show them what you can do and then ask the question again. Yeah. But, Maybe it's not just what people need, but what they're also pay for. Cause that's one of the things that like we always think of too, is like, all right, you know, if we go the beautiful baby <laughs> analysis, right? Like if you ask somebody like, hey, do you like this baby? Do you think this baby's nice? And they're like, oh yeah, that's a beautiful baby. Do you want this baby? <laughs> I'll charge, like, will you pay $10,000 for this baby? It's like, it's a totally different question. It um, is. I, and I remember a guy coming and you probably can't release this because he's probably out there and see the video and I'll get in trouble for this. But <laughs> I was working at Kodak and he came and I just had my, my youngest was like really little and he had this like, staff it looked like i don't know gandalf's walking stick or something and he walks up to me and goes what do you think of this i'm like nice stick <laughs> and he's like well you use it to measure your child's height as they grow i'm like oh that's nice he's marking off his child's height and he said you know most people do it on the door frame but you move what are you gonna do take the door frame with you i'm like true but if you mark it on the stick you can take the stick with you i'm like oh that's a nice idea i've patented my stick he says i'm like oh you patented the stick how much do you, would you pay for a stick like this? I'm like, truthfully, nothing. I live in the woods. I would walk up there and pick up a stick. <laughs> but the reality is I don't want a stick. Yeah, absolutely. And so it can be the most beautiful stick in the world or Gandalf staff and it still could be potentially worthless. I remember him like looking, I'm like, how much would you pay for that? I'm like, mm -hmm. and there I am. I mean, I'm like 
I was 34 years old, right? So I had not yet developed, I mean, it was hopeless at this point that I was ever going to develop tact. I'm like, nothing. <laughs> what stick? I have a lot of sticks. <laughs> That's great. Um, all right. So the one question that like, I always try to like wrap it up with everyone with um, is if computers didn't exist, what career choice would you have chosen? Would you have been that astronaut you talked about at first? <laughs> well, I think the astronaut probably would have needed computers. <laughs> but I had, I actually went back to school because I wanted to be an astronaut. So that was not like a pipe dream. Like I want to be an astronaut. I wanted to be an astronaut, but I have terrible vision. And it was very <laughs> clear that this astronaut would, I may be able to get a job with NASA. I may work on great things, but I am not getting shot off into space anytime. <laughs> so that, that really was my plan. And this is, this is plan B. I'm still hoping. <laughs> so if Elon Musk sees this, I'm still hoping Elon, that I can go into space. Elon, you hear that? <laughs> but um, so that was, that was actually a real thing. But I think, you know, if you ask that person that question at any point in their life, they're going to give you a different answer. Like if you'd asked me that question when I was 20, I would have given you a different answer. And if I gave you, if you asked me that question at 30, I would have given you yet another answer. Cause you know, at 20, I wasn't at all sure I wanted to, I mean, I, I ran off to, I wanted to live in a houseboat in Panama. There's all kinds of, I want to be a travel writer because I love to write and I love to travel. And, and if you asked me at 30, I would have told you I, I was working as a, I had, was teaching the women's climbing class. I'd written a book on how to climb and I was running everywhere, climbing this, climbing that while working. I would have told you if I could have made a living at this because I was making seven bucks an hour as a climbing instructor. So I needed my day job. As <laughs> I would have told you if I could just do this, I would. Um, then if you asked me again at 40, I would have told you I really would probably prefer something more in the educational domain where I could help other women. Um, mm -hmm. And and so that I, I, every every decade, I found that my, more than every decade, it might be an ADD thing. I kept changing my mind about what it is I wanna be, but I have always loved mathematics and optics. Mm -hmm. And so it's just followed a neat stream of always coming back to that. Um, I was asked, if I want to take another CEO job, not a month ago, which oh, is not okay. in this field. And I, I remember just for a second pausing and I'm like, no, it's not optics. And you know what happens to you. Wherever you go, you seem to come right back. Yeah. So I think I like what I'm doing right now. Um, That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about Luminate and everything that you're developing there, about your career and how you transitioned from electrical engineering and optics into the entrepreneur side of things and into the investor side of things. It's really been amazing to hear your perspective on these things and so excited uh, to be investing in this visual tech and optics at such a pinnacle point in time. I'm really excited I'm, I'm, and I'm really happy to see what your group is also doing because you guys are doing something that I think is really important. Both of us are doing, we're backing women and minorities which a lot, which a lot of women and minority owned companies don't get the financial support that they really need. So I'm really glad to see what LDP does. For sure. You know, as that, that diversity of opinion and perspective, as you talked about earlier, it's critical to everything that we do, including building high value portfolios. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's wonderful to chat again and let's, let's stay in touch and keep working together some more in the future. Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sujatha. Bye.